There are countless strategies that investors have come up with over the years to maximize their returns. And while none of them are foolproof measures to get the most out of your money, or even beat the overall market, some of them have been surprisingly successful the majority of the time. Today we discuss one such strategy. Here's one surprisingly simple way regular investors can get more out of their money, and possibly beat the market in the process. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. Today's strategy is known as the moving average method and it comes from the world of technical investing. On the surface, it really is quite simple to understand and implement, but it does have some caveats that need to be kept in mind if you decide to try it out for yourself. Today we'll discuss how to implement the strategy, as well as some of those considerations. So first things first, what is a moving average? A moving average is simply a way to cut out the short-term noise produced by an investment's price fluctuations, thus making it easier to spot trends as you can see from this chart. The price of this hypothetical investment was pretty volatile over this 30-day stretch, sometimes rising or falling by 10% or more, but its general trend was upward. A moving average can be calculated in a few ways. The first and simplest method is by taking the average of an investment's price over a specific period of time. In this chart I used a 5-day moving average to smooth out the trend, but investors use a wide variety of durations to calculate their moving averages depending on their goals. Short-term investors may use time frames of hours or even minutes to get their averages, while longer-term investors may use intervals of several months to a year or even more to get their averages. Anyway, technical investors often compare these moving averages to the current price of an investment, or a second moving average, to determine if they should sell or buy. In this more simplistic variation, we're just looking to see if the current price of the investment has recently fallen below the moving average. If it has, that tells the investor that it may be a good time to cut their losses and sell. If the price should rebound and rise back above the moving average, it's usually seen as a good time to buy back in, according again to this simplistic variation of the strategy. A second, somewhat more complex way of calculating the moving average is to use an exponential moving average. This approach is still ultimately trying to accomplish the same thing as the simple moving average, it's just that instead of taking a simple arithmetic average of an investment's price, it weighs recent prices more heavily. This tends to make exponential moving average is much more responsive to sudden shifts in price movements, which can be a good or bad thing depending on your goals and the situation. Other investors use multiple moving averages to help them make investing decisions. For instance, you could use a 50 and 200 day moving average to determine the investment's trend. If the shorter term moving average, in this case the 50 day average, rises above the longer term average, then you buy. If it falls below the longer term average, then you sell. Those are the basics behind the strategy. Like I said, it's pretty simple. You're just analyzing an investment's price movements to determine its trend, and then deciding if that trend is favorable enough for you to buy the investment, or unfavorable enough for you to cash out. As you can imagine, this approach has its fair share of pros and cons. Where this approach really excels, relative to your standard buy and hold strategy anyway, is in consistently trending markets. And as we'll see with examples here in a minute, it doesn't really matter whether that trend is positive or negative, all that matters is that it's reasonably consistent. This is because it enables the moving average investment to avoid the worst of market crashes while still participating in the majority of market run-ups. For instance, take a look at these hypothetical returns for an investment. It starts off at $100 a share, but over the next handful of years it gets hammered, losing half of its value before finally rebounding. A buy and hold investor with $100 put into the markets would invest their money right away and just let it sit there regardless of how the market performs meaning that by the end of this 10 year period, their investment would be worth around $122, the same as the investment itself. That equates to an average annualized return of about 2% per year, which is not great. On the other hand, a technical investor making their trades based on indicators like a moving average may have been able to get out of the markets before the worst of the damage occurs, and thus achieve a higher overall return during this time period. As you can see in this hypothetical, I've assumed that our technical investor is using a simple two year moving average. Under these assumptions they would have wound up with a net worth of roughly $146 in this admittedly very oversimplified hypothetical. That equates to an average annual return of about 3.9% per year. Still not great 
but at the same time, it's nearly double what the buy and hold investor achieved during this decade. Where moving average approaches can struggle is when the markets experience a lot of volatility, and as a result, don't really produce a consistent trend in one direction or another. This is mainly because these choppier markets can create a lot of buy and sell signals in a relatively short period of time, which can lead to higher trading costs and possible undesirable tax consequences in addition to possibly missing out on sudden and big market reversals. Kinda like what happened between years 5 and 6 in that hypothetical. The markets experienced a sudden reversal after bottoming out in year 5 and rose by a whopping 50%, but because the moving average hadn't had enough time to adjust to that new reality, our technical investor missed out on that year's gains. And as we've seen in previous videos on this channel, it's not uncommon for markets to bounce back in a big way in the first year or so of a market rally. For a great real-world example of a time period in which the markets were generally trending upward in a way that produced superior returns for moving average investors, we need look no further than the most recent decade of the 2010s. The markets peaked in October 2007, before beginning a precipitous drop during the Great Recession that would see them bottoming out roughly 50% below their previous highs in March 2009. From there, they would more or less be on the rise for the next decade until this most recent downturn in early 2020 got started. During the near 11 year time period between the bottom of the Great Recession and the peak in early 2020, if you had simply invested $10,000 into an S&P 500 index fund and held it there, that investment would be worth roughly $50,000. If you had used a simple 50 day moving average to determine whether you should be buying or selling, your net worth would be around $60,700 by the time the market peaked in 2020. That's an average annualized return of about 15.9% per year for the buy and hold investor before dividends are reinvested, and about 18% per year, again before dividends, for the simple moving average method. For a great example of a time period when the stock market was crashing and burning, we can look to the stock market crash during the Great Depression in the early 1930s. The markets had recently experienced a crazy run up during much of the 1920s, with four of the last five years of the decade even posting price returns, meaning without dividends, of 19% or more. But in September and October, of 1929, the markets started showing signs of turbulence, which would turn into the worst crash in the history of the US stock market. When the dust finally cleared in June 1932, the markets had lost nearly 90% of their value. Buy and hold investors, naturally, fared horribly during these years, with a hypothetical $10,000 investment falling to less than $1,400 by the summer of 1932. That's the equivalent to an average annualized return of negative 52.4% per year. However, amazingly, Technical traders using a simple 50-day moving average would have actually made money in the stock market during this period. A $10,000 investment for our hypothetical moving average investor would have grown to be worth just over $11,900. That's the equivalent to a 6.8% per year annualized return, and given the market environment we're talking about here, that's enormously impressive. Of course, not all markets are as great for investors as the bull market of the 2010s, just as not all markets are as difficult for investors as those of the early 1930s. And as I said earlier, one of the things that need to be remembered about using moving averages is that they tend to work best in consistently trending market environments. Again, it doesn't really matter whether the markets are consistently trending upward or consistently trending downward, just so long as they are fairly consistently trending in whichever direction they're trending in. But not all market environments are so consistent. Take last year for instance. 2020 was pretty volatile, and as a result may have resulted in a few buy or sell signals for those keeping an eye on those moving averages. From March 23rd, 2020 to the same time next year, a $10,000 investment in the S&P 500 would have grown to around $17,500. That same $10,000 under a 50 day moving average method would have only grown to around $13,500. With that being said, there are definitely some caveats, or at least considerations, that we do want to keep in mind when it comes to using indicators like moving averages to help us make our investing decisions. One, as I already mentioned, is that this more active style of trading can sometimes lead to higher costs, namely in the form of trading costs and or some potentially serious tax consequences depending on your situation. In some cases, the difference in the costs incurred by a more active technical investor and a buy and hold investor can be significant enough to make up for most, or even all, of the additional pre-tax, pre-cost gains that the moving average approach earned the technical investor. For instance, in the post-Great Recession example that we explored a minute ago, we saw that the active investor using a simple 50-day moving average ended up with roughly a 20% edge in terms of net worth over a buy and hold investor. 
before things like taxes and trading costs were taken into account. Unfortunately for the active investor, literally all of their gains during these years would have been taxed as short-term capital gains at their ordinary income tax rate. This is because there wasn't a single instance of them buying into the market and holding that investment for at least a year and a day. In fact, it was rare for them to go more than a few months without cashing out. Which means that if the investor was in the 22% federal tax bracket, which is not all that unlikely given that they were realizing several thousand dollars worth of capital gains virtually every year, and that 22% tax bracket starts out at around $40,000 a year for singles as of 2022, literally their entire edge would have been wiped out by federal income taxes alone. It would have been even worse if they had lived in a state that also taxed their gains. So that's definitely something worth taking into consideration if you're looking at trading actively in this manner and are investing in a taxable account. Now you might be thinking, well, Dan, that's irrelevant because I can just use longer moving averages so that I'm not realizing those short-term capital gains. And on the surface, that seems like an obvious and simple solution to the problem. But there may be a catch. The catch is not all look-back periods, or the amount of time you use to calculate your moving averages, will be as successful as others in any given market environment. As we saw in the Great Recession example, using a shorter 50-day look-back period, we managed to produce superior returns compared to a buy-and-hold investor on a pre-tax, pre-cost basis. However, a longer look-back period, say 200 days since that's a pretty common one to use, wouldn't have been nearly as successful. If we had used a 200-day moving average to make our trading decisions during the Great Bull Run of the 2010s, our ending net worth would have come out to around $36,700 or a good $13,000 short of the buy and hold approach before taxes and costs are factored in. A 250 day look back period, which is roughly equivalent to a year because the markets aren't open on weekends and holidays, would have produced similar results with a $36,400 ending net worth. So yeah, different market environments will lead to different advantages or disadvantages for different look back periods. Shorter look-back periods, or using an exponential moving average instead of a simple moving average, tend to do better in markets where the trends are sharper, since it can react quicker to those changes. But market environments that are more of a slow burn can favor longer look-back periods a bit more than their shorter counterparts. And without having a crystal ball, it's darn near impossible to tell ahead of time which variation will outperform. And that's not to mention that the longer your look-back period is, the more likely it is that you'll start missing out on dividends from your investments, which can give the buy and hold approach a little bit of an extra edge. So there you have it. That's one relatively simple way that regular investors can, sometimes, beat the market. It's not a foolproof strategy to beat the market. I mean, as far as I'm aware, such a strategy doesn't actually exist. But because the markets tend to rise more often than they fall, and because human psychology and emotion tends to lead to markets building and sustaining momentum better than a random chance would suggest it should, it is an approach that can be surprisingly effective in a lot of situations, at least as long as you figure out a way to manage the potential costs associated with those more frequent trades, such as utilizing tax advantaged accounts to minimize your income tax burden, and that you're willing and able to stick to the strategy over the longer haul without shooting yourself in the foot. But what do you think? Have you ever used moving averages to help make investment decisions? What other metrics do you take into consideration? when investing? Let me know in the comments section below. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.